Hey folks, welcome back to 80 Days. Last time we made it here to Yokohama and had a meeting with this mysterious Black Rose character who wants us to do some stuff. I'm sure that'll be explained more as we go in as we move along here. Anyway, I suppose we should embark for now. So the water lead to San Francisco, it's rather expensive. But let's do it. I'm surprised at how well those galoshes are working out for us. Okay, so yes, we head on this way. The Water Lily was a sleek iron-hulled ship-to-submarine prototype captained by a severe America, an American by the name of Wicker. Um, sure, who wore a top hat at all times and preferred tea to coffee, which greatly endeared him to Monsieur Fogg. In addition to the usual compliment, the Water Lily carried an entire corps corpse of brass goggled engineers and abrasive submariners on standby should the captain call the order to submerge. The rumour was that she had been a slave ship and had only been refitted for passenger transport for a good few years after Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. But I saw no trace of a dark past aboard. The crew seemed a happy family and welcomed us onto their iron hold bosom. Lovely. I'm sure that's exciting. Hooray for when waiting is the only option. Our cabin, while hardly spacious, was adequate to our needs. One of the midshipmen came by to show us how to use the pressure seals in case of submersion. But in all other aspects, I looked forward to a peaceful steamship ocean, ocean crossing. I was not to be so lucky. Ah, uh, this might be something I've seen before as well, and I think things are going to go bad. Uh, converse, I suppose. Again, we know all of this. Anything about San Francisco? No, not really. Just pick things. When we kind of have an idea of where we want to go, it's not doing that much. Conversing, I mean. Anyway, the salty air blew cool and sharp against my face as I opened the door onto the top deck. It was painfully early, and the only passengers awake were a group of Chinese laborers hunched miserably near the stern. One of their number was vomiting capaciously into a bucket. I offered him... my own secret remedy, which I had brewed up for just such an occasion. He swallowed it down with a certain dubious desperation, but immediately improved in both complexion and temperament. He thanked me most profusely. Um, hmm. I asked him about the captain, but with no language in common, in common, communication was impossible. So we settled into playing dice in quiet silence until the sun rose. I just noticed it's day 42. Oh boy. <laughs> I don't know if we're going to make it at this point. We might. I think it depends on what route we're going to go through North America. If I do it, if we, if I do end up taking the train, which I've done like a whole bunch of times, it's going to be boring for me, but it's probably the best way to do it. I don't know. We'll see. I accompanied Monsieur Fogg to a game of whist with a family of American missionaries who were traveling back to San Francisco for a family wedding. My master began strongly, but Mademoiselle Loretta, the eldest girl, had a sharp eye and won several hands in a row. A new round was dealt. I noticed Mademoiselle Loretta... Slip Ooh, we could call her out on cheating? Hmm, we should probably do that. Slip a card into her sleeve. I blinked twice in pure astonishment and glanced up at her face, which was utterly calm, betraying nothing of the action of her nimble fingers. The minister's daughter was a cheat, and a skilled one at that. Do we call her out? I think we should call her out, right? But then, hmm, I wonder what happened if we didn't. Nah, we'll call her out. I called her out in front of the gaming party. She denied the charge prettily, and then burst into floods of beautifully manufactured tears. A masterful performance. My mom would have been most proud. Alas, Monsieur Fogg had an Englishman's reaction to... What is that? Lacrimose? I've n I don't think I've ever seen that word before. Lacrimose femininity? And was so possessed of an ir irresistible desire to flee its damp radius. That was ungentlemanly, he said curtly, after we had taken a somewhat hasty leave. I hung my head, feeling my master's censure keenly. I had been utterly outplayed at the social game, and had my master, 
and had placed my master in the impossible position of choosing between a lady's honor and my own. Our journey continued on. Yeah, maybe we shouldn't have done that, huh? Now this might be the part where things go bad. <laughs> Interesting. Pretty sure something's about to happen here. I spent today in the company of the Water Lily Submariners. They were all hardy men and women who preferred the dim enclosed spaces of the hold to the top deck. Too much sky, one of them said, squinting suspiciously. Her crewmate nodded. All that fresh air. They shuddered collectively and suggested a bracing race to the boiler room. Uh, ooh, hey, that's interesting, let's do that. I told them that I had met this ship's owner on the Trans-Siberian Express, and he had, in particular, commented on the skill of the submarine crew. For salty types, they were easily flattered. Hmm, maybe not on this occasion. H how far are we along here? Not even halfway. <laughs> God damn. Here you go, Fog, why not? I was climbing the rigging entirely innocently and not at all for the purposes of spying on the crew to appease my own rapacious curiosity when I heard two of the crewmen arguing in a pidgin mix of English and Japanese. I closed my eyes and listened to their voices. Only a few words were audible over the howling of the wind, shrine, heathen, worship, before a sudden scream rent the air. One of the sailors was falling from the platform's edge. I was unable to look away as he fell. His body lay still and crumpled on the deck, but I heard his scream in my head for days after. I looked up and managed to catch sight of the fallen sailor's companion, his face still and pallid. Was that guilt in his eyes or merely shock? He slipped away before the captain arrived, and... I followed him? He retired to the crew quarters, and I began to hear the sound of desperate muttered prayers. Hmm. I don't remember that occurring. I wonder if he killed the guy. Hmm. I doubt it, but it might have happened. I don't know. Hmm. I thought that might have been a route unlocked, but no, it was not. The Water Lily's crew held a funeral for the dead sailor. I was not specifically invited, but felt a sense of responsibility having witnessed the man's fatal plunge. Captain Wicker led the Christian service with customary grimness. I was surprised by the absence of, ooh, the sailor's companion, who had been arguing with him just before his fall. Yet he was not the only one missing from the funeral. Oddly, only half the crew had come to pay their respects. I... asked my neighbor about this breach of custom, and she narrowed her eyes. Joseph was a convert, she told me defiantly. The captain taught him to read the Bible himself. The rest of the crew are heathens. They stay away from our godly ceremonies. Hmm. Intriguing. Oh, I think I know what this this whole journey is about now. I think I know what's going to happen here. And hmm, I remember it not going well for me the last time I did it. Storm. Too exhausted to write a proper entry. Suffice to say, we are still afloat. That night, I remembered to adjust the pocket watch as we had crossed the international date line and gained ourselves a day. Yay! That'll just happen at some point. Depending on where you are, you'll just get that little bit of text at the end. Again, maybe I'm thinking of something else. Uh, I don't know which one I'm thinking of. This might be it or it might not. Guess we'll converse for no reason. Just, just, just pick some things again. I feel like I picked everything at the end here. There's got to be something. Okay, interesting. Yesterday's storm hit us with little warning. One moment I was... Preparing Monsieur Fogg's shaving water to exactly the right temperature. The next we were being tossed from one end of the cabin to the other. We were only lucky that the bed was securely nailed to the floor. The ship shuddered and moaned as the seas flickered with lightning. The storm lasted nearly six hours and blew us far off course. The captain spent most of the day peering at his charts trying to locate our position. 
There is no land anywhere upon the horizon. Oh dear. Oh no, we're going the wrong way. This is bad. This is kind of, kind of an issue. Yeah, well, we're going to Honolulu now, I guess. Hmm, I don't like this very much. Not really at all, to be honest. Not really at all. Just, just pick things. Just, just pick things, I don't know. Oh no. This is going south. Kind of literally at this point, but this is not going well. The captain announced a change of destination. The water lily would now make from nearby Hawaii rather than San Francisco. We would make port in Honolulu in five days and would have to find our own further conveyance from there. No, I don't like that. Once your fog's lips pressed ever so slightly together, a rare outward sign of entirely understandable annoyance. This, my master said, will not do. Indeed not, sir, I agreed, not even daring to calculate the delay and expense of our unexpected diversion would cause. Once your fog gave me a cool, appraising glance. Captain Wicker has renounced upon his word as a gentleman, he said curtly, before lowering his voice to an almost furtive undertone. Our course is clear. We must mutiny. I opened my mouth. Yeah, this is the one I was thinking of. So, I think how this section works is there's a whole bunch of options you'll get each day and you have to pick the right ones to to do something, to get it to actually work. Hmm, I don't know, we'll see. Anyway, I opened my mouth to agree wholeheartedly, but he continued on without so much as a pause. See to it, Passport 2. Use your... Let's go with funds, I replied, nodding. Quite, he said with the agree agreeableness of a gentleman who has just given his valet a near Herculean task. We will mutiny in five days when we reach Honolulu. Make your preparations as you see fit. This is not going to go well. I think bad things are happening. My task was clear. I was to foment mutiny aboard the Water Lily. I decided to begin by exploiting the crew's animosity towards one another. Divide and conquer, or so dear Maman always cons counseled. Hmm. I think last time I picked the religious one? Maybe we'll try the other one. Gossip in a rumor would be a good way to start, I thought, though such subtleties might also be lost on a crew of sailors. So I decided to... Hmm. What have we got as our options here? If the game would let me scroll down, thank you. Hmm. Hmm. Choices, choices. Maybe we'll desecrate the shrine, that might be a good way to do things. So I decided to desecrate the Shinto shrine and blame it upon the zealous Christian converts of the crew. It was not long before the Shinto adherents began to seethe and mutter of their ill treatment, looking towards the captain with suspicious eyes. Such suspicion could easily be tipped into revolt. Okay, seemed like that was a pretty decent choice. Just wait. I don't know how this is going. Oh man, I'm worried we're not going to make it. It was with satisfaction that I noticed a certain increase in tension aboard the Water Lily, a situation I would carefully have to excavate if my martyr's mutiny was to have any chance of success. Next I attempted to ingratiate myself with... Hmm... Let's go with the Submariners. With them, who were rather storm-tossed and disgruntled. There are no storms underwater, the commander muttered, her hair a tangle underneath her cap. Ooh. Maybe we should try to bribe her. I'm, I'm willing to try it, I've got the money. I tried to buy her loyalty with 500 pounds. She nodded darkly, then looked around our group. Around her group. That's only 50 pounds each. 3,000 and you have a deal. Oh man. That's like... 
that's all of our money. But, but it might be worth it. If we do this, if we do this, I'm sure it'll, like, succeed in everything, but then we might get stuck later because we'll need to pay to get anywhere. Though we do have a bunch of stuff we can sell. And if worst comes to worst, we can go by the bank in wherever we end up. I think I'm going to do it. I think I'm going to do it. I paid, and she nodded. I will convince a few others as well, she agreed. All right. Yeah, you don't say. <laughs> they certainly are running low all of a sudden. Goodness. I don't know if that was the right call, but we'll see what happens, I guess. Okay, sure. I had attempted to suborn the obvious targets aboard the Water Lily, but wars were often won by the unexpected. With that in mind, I turned my attention upon... Ooh, the ship's artificer might be something to consider. Let's do that. I turned my attention upon the ship's artificer, a tall, rather imposing woman in a short jacket embroidered with the guild's copper lily. Artificers were no notoriously neutral in the matter of conflict or civil disruption. But I bribed her with 50 pounds, or rather I should say I tried to bribe her. She slapped me before throwing the money at my feet. Do not, she warned, towering over me intimidatingly, ever try to bribe an artificer. Hmm. That may not have worked so well. Hmm, well, okay. Probably not, I suspect. Things could be going much better than they are right now. I spent the day putting the last finishing touches to my planned mutiny. It was a matter as delicate and serious as creation of a souffle by a master chef. I spread word of my signal amongst my allies, and... Let's say stayed up late. Stayed up late, ensuring every man and woman on my side was true. We probably haven't even done enough. I guess we'll see in a moment. I don't like this at all, to be honest. We reached Honolulu in the dark. The captain took a small skiff into the harbour with a few of his officers, wishing to inquire about repairs before putting the water lily into dry dock. Monsieur Fogg watched the boat for a long moment. Now is the time, he said crisply. I trust everything is in order? Um, I voiced my doubts about the readiness of the crew to mutiny, which caused Fogg to almost heave a sigh. Let's hope that you are, in this case, mistaken. With that, my master retreated to his cabin, and I called the signal to arms. The water lily erupted into chaos. Everywhere was the clash of sabers and pistols. Now and then I heard the shriek of the officer's sonic weapons. But I was not alone. Half of the crew that followed the Shinto creed fell in behind me with a rallying cry. They fought their Christian crewmates with vicious determination, clearing the top deck within the hour. The Chinese laborers rewarded my friendship with steadfast loyalty, throwing themselves into mutiny with all the desperation of men and women who utterly loathed sea travel and longed to revenge themselves upon their instrument of torment in any fashion. They lit fires and tore up the, ready, the already ragged sails, causing some welcome chaos. The submariners, led by Commander Davis, charged out of the hold of the ship like a horde of impossibly athletic avenging angels. There was a long, terrible moment where I, when I wondered at their allegiance. Then Captain Commander Davis caught my eye and winked. It's Izumi too, it's Izumi... It's Izumi to my friends, she shouted cheerfully, driving back any stragglers loyal to Captain Wicker. By noon, it was clear how the day would end. The mutineers raised a ragged vic cheer of victory. I myself had ended up with a debonair scratch upon the cheek, and had somehow come to be in possession of a brace of pistols and three sabers. By the time the captain and the officers returned, we had complete control of the ship. They were quickly trussed and... returned to their skiff to seek their fortune in Honolulu. Once your fog emerged, surveying the scene of the recent battle with a calm eye. Well done, he said, with classic gentlemanly understatement. Still, it was well done and more, if I do say so myself. So it actually worked out. The question is, ah, that gets us off going somewhere else. Probably a lot faster, I'd hope. Guess we'll converse as usual. 
and this will get us nothing new because <laughs> it seems to just not ever do so oh man we must be flying maybe hard to tell when it's all water <laughs> To my amazement, the successful mutineers held a vote and elected me the new captain of the Water Lily. Uh, yeah, I tried to refuse to little avail. What did I, Passport 2, know of captaining a vessel such as this? Rest assured, Messer me, it was in great part a ceremonial title which made no particular demands on my seamanship. Monsieur Fogg, though pleased by the success of our mutinous endeavour, seemed to regard my elevation in rank with some wariness. I am, he admitted as we prepared for bed. Some were put in mind of Bonaparte. Parbleu! Whatever, I don't know what any of that means. That name sounds familiar, but I don't know. Anyway. Otherwise, the succession passed smoothly, and I acquired Wicker's top hat as a mark of office. Nice. More pointless conversing. What does Fogg know anything about? Okay. What's next? The new first mate, a cheerful girl by the name of Wang, came to me with an intriguing notion. As you know, the Water Lily is a ship-to-submarine prototype, she said. If the submarine is cooperated, we could convert to a submersible and make it to uh, make port at San Francisco in two days rather than five. Well, I don't see why not, really. I called in Izumi, who greeted me with a flourish and a bow. My dear captain, she declared, not bothering to hide her amusement, do you have orders for me? Can you get us to San Francisco in four days? Izumi's eyes sparkled. Captain, I have been waiting for that order all my life. I'll make preparations and we will submerge tomorrow at dawn. Let me just double check that. In two days? But then here he says four days. Yeah, whatever, I'm sure it'll work out. And then we were underwater. Ooh. I do like the ambient sounds in this game. Some some vehicles you don't really hear much, but sometimes you do and it's quite nice. Izumi was a woman of her word. At dawn, the water, li water lily began its preparations to submerge. I cannot record the technical particulars of the Enterprise, but my own experiences were thus. Uh, it began with an unholy grinding of gears, so loud that I felt my head would shatter in two. The sails furred and the masts collapsed. The screw propeller engines transformed themselves, bells and alarms sounded as the bulkheads were closed and sealed. Within an hour, the water lily had transmuted from a surface skimming steamer to a watertight submarine. Izumi tossed, tossed me a fearless grin as she called for us to descend. My ears popped as we plunged ever deeper into the water of the Pacific Ocean and a curious sounding silence descended upon the vessel. This is pretty neat. Oh man, we're going so fast, that's awesome. I had little to do but pace the preternaturally quiet corridors of the submarine. Izumi and her crew were in firm and able control. I resolved to enjoy myself. I was still captain of the Water Lily, even in a new configuration. The crew saluted every time I happened to saunter into their vicinity. On the whole, I would rather recommend submarining to the discerning traveller. We surfaced a few miles out from San Francisco. Apparently a submarine emerging without warning in a harbour could cause all sorts of misunderstandings and complications. Izumi recommended that we row into the port on a skiff. I formally renounced my captaincy to Izumi. Yeah, that seems fair as she was clearly the most capable sailor aboard the Water Lily. She blushed in pleasure, and seemed unaccountably delighted. Good fortune, Passport 2, she called as we rode away. You always have a home aboard the Water Lily. I turned towards San Francisco, still shrouded in the pale pre-dawn light. We have gained three days, my master said, and I could not help my answering smile. That worked out pretty well, I think. Alrighty. Oh, right at the start of the day as well, okay. Oh, I don't see why we shouldn't explore right away then.
down to San Pedro, which goes to Acapulco. I don't know why I'd really want to go down that way, to be honest. It seems better to go across North America rather than down towards South America. Anyway, San Francisco seemed less a city and more a ravenous beast bent on consumption of everything, even of itself. Within the ever-expanding city limits, uh, the building works made it tricky to talk to anyone, such was the infernal constant noise. I sloped towards recently constructed Long Bridge, which was crowded with families out for a stroll and people fishing for silvery smelt with long poles. In the water was a jangle of rowing boats racing each other and boatmen taking passengers out to Mission Rock. Cheers and good-natured shouts emitted from a halfway house in the middle of the bridge. Um, I scoured the water for boats we might take, but there seemed to be none heading out, or were fishing. A man, red-faced and somewhat the worse for drink, bumped into me. I excused myself politely, and he made an apology in return, slinging an arm around my shoulders. Oh, hello, he exclaimed. You don't sound like you're around from here. Uh, you do not sound American either, I retorted. No matter. I was Dutch once, in a past life, but now I am as American as President Grant. This is a land of newcomers. You a prospector? Uh, let's just say we're a traveler. I am a traveler, he said. I am traveling around the world. He laughed. He laughed, sorry, wrong inflection. Oh yeah, and I'm a, Najavo, a Navajo chief. I insisted on the truth, sketching out in brief some of my adventures with my master. What, really? His eyes widened and he slapped his thigh. That's incredible. A brown-skinned woman slipped her arm into his. I looked for an introduction and the man smiled quickly. Ah, my manners, he shook his ruddy face. I am Anders, and this is my wife Jenny. Uh, a pleasure to meet you, I kissed her hand. She was surprised, but smiled. Always a pleasure to meet Anders, friends. She looked askance at the whiskey flask in his hands, but seemed to find me unobjectionable. I hesitated, the obvious question about her origins on the tip of my tongue. Mm, let's maybe not ask about that. I swallowed back the question, though clearly with a visible effort, for she laughed with full throated pleasure. I'm of the Modoc tribe, what the new Americans call Indians. Jenny rolled her eyes. I do not mind your surprise. Most of my tribe has, take, has been taken to the Klamath Reservation in Oregon. Uh, that's a good question. What is a reservation? Jenny looked at me with utter astonishment. They are... tracts of land where the first peoples are relocated. When the whites decide they want the gold, the silver, the coal, the buffalo in our homelands. Anders whispered something into Jenny's ear and she laughed, though I feared I had opened an old wound with my prying questions. I nodded and found my way back to Monsieur Falk, who was sitting drinking tea with a disconsolate frown. It tastes like soap, he remarked, but would say no more. Nice. Anyway, we can depart. So we can take the boring train ride. Which I might actually do, all things considered. Departs at five. I mean, I've done this twice before, but it is very quick. I think it's gonna be fairly quick. Let's see. Ooh, it takes a week. But then when we get over there. When we get over there, we'll be pretty damn close, won't we? I think I might do that actually. I know I said I wouldn't, but I might this time. But I think we'll leave it off here for now. We will do some more train riding next time, I suppose. So, see you next time for that. For now, thanks for watching. And I'll see you around.